So, hi everybody, I'll start the webinar now. Could someone just do a thumbs up if you can hear me and see my slides? Cool, thanks. Okay, so yeah. We'll get going with this seminar, The Potential of Smartphone Voice Recordings to Monitor Depression Severity. Um, so I'm uh, Dr. Nicholas Commons, or Nick as I'm known. I'm a lecturer in AI for Speech Analysis for Health at King's College London, and I also work with Academia AI. My research interests are sort of speech processing for healthcare, as well as affective and behavioral computing. I have a background of doing postdocs in computer science at a couple of different universities in Germany, as well as having a bachelor's and a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. So what I'm aiming to cover and introduce to you guys during this talk today is an introduction or a reminder for some of you as to why speech is a really unique and powerful health signal. We'll talk about speech in the radar MDD study, specifically looking at engagement, phenotyping and detection work we've done there. And then we'll end the talk by overviewing some of the challenges for translating speech analysis into clinical practice. So yeah, before we get going as well, if you do have some questions as I'm going along, please feel free to type them into the chat and I'll come back around and answer them at the end. So yeah, starting with why speech is such a unique health signal. And speech has this potential to be a biomarker, so something that can be used as a surrogate marker for different clinical endpoints. So helping with diagnosis, monitoring treatment, monitoring change in symptoms, these sort of things. Speech is really good for this in a few different circumstances. And the reason we can use speech in health is because speech production is really complex. It's also a very highly sensitive signal. So speech under different pathology pathologies somehow differs from its corresponding normal state and then we're able to use signal processing and sometimes combined with machine learning to help identify differences between speech in a uh, normal state and speech in some sort of pathological or some sort of unhealthy state and as I said the reason for doing this is speech production is really complex it's a combined cognitive and muscular action so obviously when we want to speak, we have to, you know, think of what we want to say, as well as doing that, we need to sort of generate all the muscular commands that we need for speech. And we also need to monitor our own speech signal. And at the muscular side of it, we're combining the action of our respiratory systems, our vocal tract, our articulatory muscles, which is the coordination of sometimes up to a hundred different muscles. And, uh, well, for English anyway, an average speaking rate of four syllables per second, speaking actually uses more muscle fibers and uses them quicker than any other human activity. And this is why it's this highly sensitive signal. When we start to get different health conditions, they start to interrupt this either at a cognitive, at a muscular level, or at both. And then we can start to find these differences and then use them as these digital biomarkers. So some examples of some biomarkers and where they can interrupt. We have the um, we have speech at a sort of message level. So obviously we need to decide what we want to say. And there's different rules for sort of how we put this together. Obviously, we need to put together individual sounds to make words. We need to put them words into sentences to make sense in some sort of language code. And we need to understand how all these words relate to each other and choose the best combination of them, given the context that we want to speak in. And when we have conditions such as depression, it's very easy for this process to be interrupted. Uh, this is often at a more unconscious level. People might not be aware they're doing it. So people with increased depression severity 
often speak with more first person pronouns and use more negative words. So that's just an example of a biomarker looking at the message formation end. As well as sort of the words that we speak, there's quite a lot of information in the acoustic and the prosodic side of speech as well. So prodigy is the melody of speech. It's variations in rhythm, stress, intonation, and this overlaps a lot with expressed emotions. So if you think of a difference between how your speech might sound when you're happy or how your speech might sound when you're sad, a lot of these differences are in the prosodic information. And prodigy can also help change the meaning of a sentence. So think of something saying, someone saying a sentence in a very sincere manner, someone saying something in a very sarcastic manner. It's the same words, it's just said with a different tone, in a different stress or intonation, and we've changed the whole complete meaning of a sentence. We know that prodigy, as I've said, is linked with emotions, but it's also linked with a lot of different mental health disorders, including generalized anxiety disorders, where we see an increase in both the mean and the variance of pitch with increase in, in anxiety severity symptoms. So as I already mentioned, speech also has these huge amount of muscle fibers it uses. And the first group of these muscles is the respiratory system. So to power up speech, we need to provide our vocal tract with stable air pressure throughout each sentence that we're trying to stay. So this requires us to breathe in, obviously, and then breathe out in a very slowly controlled manner and speak over the top of this. And it's also, as well as providing the air pressure we need to produce noise, it's also sort of like the power of it. If we want to speak longer, if we want to shout, we need to inhale more and then exhale is either quicker or more controlled over this. An example of a biomarker affecting the respiratory system that we could see in speech is obviously something like COVID-19 or other sort of um, respiratory disorders, which will affect our lung functioning and therefore will have some effect in any resulting speech that might come through with us. The next part of speech production is phonation. So this is the first stage of converting breath sounds into speech sounds and the vocal folds play a massive part of this procedure. So we either produce harmonic speech or voice speech, and this is when the vocal folds are active. So the vocal folds are, are vibrating at a particular rate, and this produces the harmonic sounds that we hear. So sounds like A, E, I, O, and U coming through there. We've also got the unvoiced speech. So the vocal folds are lax, they're open, and this is where we sort of create pressure in our vocal tract by constricting it at a very point, often higher in the vocal tract, and letting this air out in a more explosive manner. So things, noises like F, S, and T. And things like phonation get interrupted by muscular disorders. Things like ALS, things like MS, often affect uh, actions of our vocal folds. And this can result in the speech sounding different, but also we can get measurable sort of measures from these differences because it's an action of the vocal folds not shutting properly. It's letting through more air. The vocal folds might be more tense. These changes how we hear the speech and things we're able to perceive from that. So you see there's a couple of things in the chat. Mm -hmm. The final part of speech production is articulation. So this is changing the speech sound coming out of our vocal folds and actually changing it into very specific speech sounds. And this is done by essentially changing the shape of our vocal tract. As we change the shape of our vocal tract, we're constricting our vocal tract at different points. And this is essentially filtering the sound. So it, compresses some frequencies, it amplifies some frequencies and produces very unique speech sounds. And this is obviously a very complicated procedure. We've got a lot of different speech sounds we extract and we have to hold our vocal fold, our vocal tract of very distinct positions to get this done. And we're doing this very, very quickly. We're changing this time and time again. And this is one of the reasons sort of learning to speak takes a while because we have to learn this sort of fine muscular control. 
also sometimes found it hard. I had to learn German while I was living there. I did find it hard to produce some of the softer vowel sounds that come in German in German because it was a to me felt a very unnatural way of sort of holding my throat, holding my sort of articulatory muscles in those positions to produce those sounds. It felt a bit unnatural to me because it wasn't a sound I was used to actually saying. So there's these sort of things that we need to learn, and especially as we go into different languages, especially languages might not be related to our, our first language, but it can become very different and very things we learn as well. Example biomarkers coming through here is that we know that with conditions such as post-traumatic stress disorder and coming back to major depressive disorders, they actually affect how our vocal tract moves and changes the sort of area or distribution of speech sounds. So instead of having a distribution where all our speech sounds are nice and unique, these speech sounds start to blur into each other a bit more. So almost like a very slurry quality at the extreme end of this. But it just means that individual unique sounds are a little less unique with these different disorders as we start to see things like psychomotor retardation. So different things that just sort of affect muscle coordination come into play there might be a tightening again of the neck muscles of the vocal tract muscles and this cleanness this crispness isn't there in the resulting speech and these are obviously again things we can pick up and measure using signal processing aiding this through machine learning to help us so yeah that was just a very brief very quick introduction as to why speech is a unique and powerful health signal and as I said, speech can be used to detect the abnormalities relating to cognitive disorders, abnormalities in logistic, affect, motor, all these sort of things. There's different areas we can pick up on, pull different parts of the signal out, and then relate them back to different disorders. And the literature highlights the potential of speech analytics across a wide range of clinical applications. And mental health applications are among the more prominent in the literature with major depressive disorders playing a part of this in particular, which is the lead into the next part of the talk, which is where I'll talk about speech in the radar MDD study, and in particular looking at engagement, phenotyping and detection in this study. So the radar MDD study was part of the remote assessment for disease and relapse central nervous system, so radar CNS study which was a big international program exploring how wearable devices and smartphones can be used to measure depression, multiple sclerosis and epilepsy. It was an IMI funded project, so it had high levels of engagement with industry and brought together lots of experts from different domain and also had a high level of patient input throughout the project so we could try to make solutions that were more fitting towards their end users who would probably go on to use such as the technologies we were developed. And we we're interested in looking at wearable and remote technology to collect health information because it's a continuous and persuasive source of data. We're sort of looking at changing, I guess, almost the conventional medical paradigm of someone going to a doctor when they feel ill or someone who's having more regular care, checking in with a clinician once a month, once every two months and talking a bit about how they've gone over the past month but instead allowing us to collect data as people go about their day-to-day -day lives and build use this data to build up a really rich source of health information about the person that is more objective in nature as well and something that we're able to feed either forward to the patient, eventually through personalised medicine, or also feed summaries into clinicians, into doctors to allow them to actually have a look and see how a person has gone in related to some key metrics over the past month. So it's a very powerful form of medicine, but obviously there's a lot to do and realize that as we go through. And speech is definitely a key part of this because of all the reasons we sort of spoke about earlier in the talk. The speech was collected in the depression arm, or it was collected in all arms, but we're gonna focus on the depression results today in um, using a specially designed app. So people had to act actively go into the app to record their speech. Uh, the speech activities comprised essentially doing two different recordings every two weeks for approximately two years. We had a task where they read an excerpt from the North Wind and the Sun, which is a popular elicitation prompt in speech health research or in speech research in general. 
And we also ask people to tell us something you're looking forward to in the next seven days, which was quite an interesting choice of prompt in hindsight, especially when we started these recordings not that long before the pandemic broke out. And it definitely, yeah, we'll talk more about choice of prompts and things as we go along. As part of the data collection, the um, we assess deparity suppression, deparity depression severity at the same time as um, the speech prompts using a PHQA questionnaire, which is a very widely used self-reported questionnaire for depression severity and is clinically validated. Um, as I said, we schedule speech recordings every two weeks in a clinical cohort of hundreds of participants with diagnosed depression for almost up to two years. And there's really been no other speech health study like this in terms of the longitudinal length of the study and also the amount of participation in it. So we thought that this was a massive opportunity to assess things like feasibility how did people go about recording their speech? What things did they like about it? What things didn't they like about it? To essentially allow us to start to design better prompts. And it is because of this as well, this sort of need to log into apps to record speech. We weren't doing these things passively, we were doing them actively. So we had to make sure that they were easy to use, convenient, people felt comfortable contributing data. They were more or less agnostic to different disorder specifications. People perceived them as being useful and people didn't have, of course, rec recording something like speech, different privacy concerns. So there's a lot of different domains and things to take care of when we start to collect audio and especially collect audio remotely. So away from clinical settings, away from more private settings where people we ask them to do it in, in and about their daily life. So we did find that people recorded their speech. Looking at the completion rate over the whole study, we found that completion rate was, they recorded about on average once in every three times for both tasks. We found that the scripted speech task had a slightly higher completion rate than the free speech. What we did find was there is quite a large standard deviation and quite a large range in the completion rates of this we found this was very sort of interesting um we've done a lot of work comparing the, this with depression severity and trying to look for reasons why people might and may not give us speech samples so we looked at the effect of baseline depression on speech tasks so this was each person's level of depression when they first were introduced to the speech task we did statistical tests where we controlled for their age, gender, their country and their level of education, as well as baseline anxiety, which is um, comorbid with depression. And we found that baseline depression had no effect on the completion of speech tasks. So essentially people were completing their speech regardless of their level of depression. So this is a very good thing as this is obviously in this sort of area. One of the things we want to make sure of that we don't just collect more speech from people with lower levels of depression, that we're collecting it sort of more evenly across the spectrum of scores. We did the same test, switching depression and anxiety around. And we found that again, there was no evidence that baseline anxiety had a significant effect on the completion of the speech tasks. So this was really good. But obviously there are other factors coming in board. We only got a tiny bit over sort of one third completion rate from everybody. So we wanted to understand a bit more about sort of what's going on, what factors might be at play here. So we ran a participant survey, which was a very detailed first of its kind study in M Health. We had just under 300 people respond to our survey. We had it all linked up so we were able to compare people's responses to the amount of data they gave us. And we were particularly interested in sort of levels of comfort towards the two different tasks and what people perceived as barriers for recording their speech. So what we found looking at the scripted task, people felt a lot more comfortable doing this than they did doing the free speech task. And this is not that surprising. As I said, we were asking a, a depressive cohort, 
with um, in a pandemic what they were looking forward to. So yeah, I think this is, circumstances definitely did not help with the free speech, but it's something we need to pick up and look at in future studies. But overall, we did find the majority of people were comfortable recording the scripted speech tasks. So we were quite happy with that as a result. When we looked at people who were are people more comfortable, give us more speech and yes, comfort towards the task is definitely related to completion of the tasks. And whilst these might seem like very sort of self-evident findings, these are also the first time we've actually been able to definitively show these in a speech study. So they're really exciting from that point of view. And we just essentially need to understand these human computer interfaces, this HCI component of data collection a lot more, get more participant feedback into these studies to actually design better speech prompts and better elicitation prompts to collect more speech in future studies. It's something I'll come back to in later slides. We also, as I said, asked people what they perceived as barriers from them preventing their speech. The biggest barrier we saw were people didn't see notifications. Um, we speculate the reason for this is that the notifications were just sort of sent out first thing in the morning. So they were probably quite easy to miss. And the full collection protocol for the study was actually quite large. So the speech sort of notification could have easily got lost in a bunch of other notifications there as well. We did see that people found it difficult. We did ask them to record in a quiet spot and people often found it difficult to do this. So potentially we need to use the phones, we need to use a bit of AI behind this to start to look for better ways to allow people to record, allow people to actually see notifications. A few people did report tech issues. Um, this was a custom built app that we were using and developing at the same time as the project. So a few tech issues was not surprising for us. On the good side of things, privacy concerns were quite low across the people that we surveyed or the people who responded to our survey. Few people, even though people didn't do the speech task, only a very small number of people actually directly sort of drew our attention to it. And nobody found the instructions difficult to understand. Well, nobody reported that they found the instructions difficult to understand, which is really good. So there's a few sort of positives and a few negatives coming out of that. As part of this survey, we also asked people to report how much they believed they were doing the speech task. And then we compared this to our actual completion. And we found that this is very spread over sort of level of self-reporting versus level of actual completion that people aren't aware of how much they were actually doing the task whether or not this is related to misnotifications playing a role in this whether or not this was some form of social embarrassment that people wanted to say yes even though they sort of knew that they weren't really doing the task as much as they should we don't know but it was still quite an interesting insight that again the sort of HCI side of things needs to be built up to help us understand speech collection a little bit more. Finally, we asked people if they were rec recording, willing to record their speech in future. And overwhelmingly, people said yes to this, both to help them manage their depression and also in the research domain. So that was, I think, a really nice positive finding to end that survey on. We we're very sort of excited about that. So back to what we actually collected and talking a bit more about the different biomarkers and phenotypes that came out from the study, we collected just over 60 hours of speech in total across the different tasks and across three collection sites in the Netherlands, Spain and the UK. We collected overwhelmingly more data in the UK, but we had more participants there, so that wasn't super surprising for us. Um, and yeah, we were very happy with the sort of large number of participants and the large number of actual recordings that we were able to get through this. So how did we compare with previous studies or previous longitudinal studies that were done? So looking across the literature, we found that we collected speech from a greater number of participants than any other study to date. We collected speech over a longer period than any other study to date. And we also collected speech in more languages than any other study to date. 
And uh, we, whilst they were recorded in the native language, everybody was using the same app, following the same prompts, just within their native language group within there. So the results are a bit more comparable than record, you know, trying to compare two different, completely different studies and compare those results. So yeah, we're really happy with sort of what we got from the other side of it. We definitely got a lot of really interesting speech and a lot of really interesting lessons to learn about how to improve the sort of speech collection for next time. Just looking very briefly at the socio-demographics, we have an overwhelming female majority in this, but that's not surprising. The, the sort of psychological studies always end up with that, and this is no more unbalanced than equivalent sort of studies in the literature. We found that most people met the criteria for having depression upon entry into the study, but again, that is sort of what we wanted because it was a study into longitudinal depression and people had to meet the criteria of at least having a depressive relapse within the last six months. So yeah, really cool study. We've done a first look at different speech features and we wanted to compare them across different longitudinal studies in the literature. In the literature, we see that speech pause measures are particularly important. So this is the sort of gap between words increases with increasing depression. And we also found that sort of speech timing measures were important. So speakable spoke slower. These findings are all from shorter term studies, as I said, and these findings are also from studies not based in real life and not using such a wide clinical cohort that we had. So sorry about quite a lot of results on the one slide here. The, what we did was compare a range of sort of typical speech features across the different studies and just looked at their confidence intervals of trying to predict depression. We use linear mixed effects models for this, where we were able to put in some key covariants relating to age, gender, height, and use in education, as well as account for repeated measures within each person, everything standardized and comparable. And what we can see across the different studies, are the main ones were the speaking rate and articulation rate in the free speech task uh, have confidence intervals that are all reduced, uh, all, all sort of got this negative trend of decreasing speech rate with increasing levels of depression across the three countries. We also see the same in intensity. Um, there's a, a lot of other features that have similar trends, mainly between the UK and the Netherlands, which is not super surprising as these are from similar Germanic language groups. The trends with Spain are a little bit different. One reason for this could be the difference just there in language type. We also have a little less data in Spain, so that could have affected our results as well. The results weren't as clear cut when looking at the free response task. Again, there are a lot of similarities between the UK and the Netherlands, but not many features return this sort of overwhelmingly positive or negative response in the Spanish data. A um, few different reasons for this. Obviously, when people uh, can answer a question in any way they want to answer it, we don't have acoustic, um, the same sort of acoustic structure anymore that we're comparing against. And yeah, also there was less people engaged with this, so our N is slightly less, so that again could affect our results. So yeah, the radar MDD data set is unique in terms of the scale, duration, number of languages recorded. We found these sort of cross-cultural features of speaking rate, articulation rate, and intensity in the free speech task. These results differed from previous longitudinal findings that were more heavily based towards pausing effects. We did see pausing effects in our English cohort. Um, it is potential that the pausing effects are more related or something to do with speaking English as opposed to speaking other languages, but obviously that requires a bit more data collection across a wider language base to dig into a bit more. Uh, we also wondered if there was some effect on being remote. So, a lot of previous studies, people were going into labs and doing speech recordings in front of a person. Obviously then they're being observed. This could change the effect from these remote studies where people are being observed. Again, it's a bit more speculative, but just things, very interesting points to sort of look forward to again in future studies. We did see differences between the scripted and the free speech findings, but there was a sort of lack of acoustic consistency in the free speech, which could have hid some of the features. 
we're going to look at these features at a more fine-grained level to see if we can sort of pull things out at a more fundamental speech sound level or word level there. I'll quickly introduce the detection work we did. Um, it was quite an interesting study we ran here where we were trying to do a machine learning prediction of essentially depression severity first up just on a two class level. So above and below 10 on the PHQ-8 scale is the difference between a sort of depression severity that is low or depression severity that is high. Uh, when we started doing this work, we found that we sort of couldn't get our system to learn much. It was very difficult. When we looked at neural networks and sort of looked at the loss function coming through these, we could see it was a bit all over the place that the system was really struggling to learn and to converge its learning on something. We moved into a sort of curriculum learning paradigm where you start to present different, essentially different severities to the network at different points of time, try to get it to learn at different parts. We thought that if we just trained it on really high, really low scores, that, that would improve it. But what we actually found was that we needed to train it on the scores closest to essentially our decision boundary to get the best results. Um, there's a few reasons that this probably worked. Sort of ambiguity in these sort of moderate levels of depression where the speech effects might not be as strong. Uh, probably one major reason the speech effects aren't probably as pronounced in what we've labeled here as the easier regions and well not pronounced in the lower easier region, easier region and very pronounced in the higher regions and maybe that had an effect of sort of really pulling our decision boundary a bit all over the place and we we're just able to learn a, a sort of smoother curve whilst when we focused on these very very small range of samples using it closest to this decision boundary we call this hard training using the hardest samples to learn from we've run a bunch of experiments looking at a bunch of different networks and feature setups and on the whole, we find that the majority of times that this hard training does work out and does work out at a statistically significant level. I've got up here the sort of English results. We see very similar results in the Dutch corpus. The evidence is less clear in the Spanish data. Spanish data had a very different distribution. It wasn't as normal distribution around this sort of 10 marker and potentially with the less ambiguous samples, we just didn't quite have enough training data to actually support this hard training paradigm. And we're writing this all up as a paper for interspeech and into a journal paper as well coming out soon. So yeah, just looking back at the radar MDD study, we've got this, we ran an engagement study. We looked at, we found no statistical evidence that depression or anxiety reduces participation in the speech task. But we did sort of note that the choice of speech task is really important for patient experience and for data collection. Uh, phenotyping, we found some language agnostic features being speaking rate, articulation rate, and intensity. And we also proposed the hard training paradigm, which consistently outperformed more classical training methods when doing a two class depression severity detection. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Judith Dunley and Edward Campbell for their great work in the engagement work and the detection work, respectively. They led those efforts and I've just sort of summed up quite nicely their results and presented them here, but thanks to both of them. So, yeah, part of the radar MDD study, especially looking at this engagement areas, was helping us realize some of the challenges that we have in trying to translate speech analysis into clinical practice. As I've already sort of said and gone on about, speech is this unique, powerful signal. There's a lot of promising results across a lot of different health domains where we can use it as this biomarker. But actually translating this, we have huge challenges. These aren't necessarily related to speech alone, but also digital biomarkers. But particularly for speech, where the collection, and I'll talk about this a bit more in the next slide, the collection is a little bit more complicated than a lot of other signals. We can't necessarily rely on machine learning advancements alone to solve all of these problems. And a lot of these problems come down to acoustics, come down to a lot of the things you guys are used to. So with speech, there's a lot, it's quite a long collection pipeline, an analytical pipeline, and there's a lot of different areas that can introduce noise and confounding factors. 
So we obviously have a choice of speech task, and this is what we're using to prompt a person. We have this recording set up in conditions. So we're asking people to record on a smartphone. We know that as people might hold or move the microphone in or closer to them, this can change the recording volume. We know that ambient noise reverberation easily get into speech recordings. We know that how it's stored, how it's digitized and compressed can affect the quality of the speech as well. And all of this alone before we start doing the sort of feature selection and the machine learning side of things and bringing in the analytics. So there's a lot of collection noise compounding factors that really need to be studied and thought about and sort of realize the, the sort of limitations of so we can push things forward and make more robust speech systems going into the future. So just taking some results from a study I ran with uh, Dr. Judith Dimley again. So what we did was collect speech in multiple devices in two different recording scenarios. So we had two identical rooms, one room we basically stripped out. So it was just the carpet and the walls and the ceiling. The next room, we had some acoustic paneling there. We had a bit of soft furnishing. So we had basically identical low and high reverberation environments. And we also used, um, a, a collected over a load of different recording uh, devices. So looking at a more standardized condenser microphone and then looking at sort of headsets and different smartphones. I'm just going to present a small number of results here where we're comparing both the reverberation effects and the effect of at least a condenser microphone versus an iPhone. And we can see that things differ, even though people are reading the same speech prompt. And, you know, all we've done is literally change either the microphone or the room. So we can see that at some point, at some, something as simple as estimating speech rate is affected by reverberation and affected by phone uh, microphone type. And obviously with that, like the number of syllables we're trying to automatically estimate from the recordings is definitely affected by these as well. We see that the number of pauses we're trying to automatically identify gets affected again by microphone type and phone type. Pitch variation isn't as affected, but we can see, see these distributions definitely changed, especially with reverberation in there. Looking at some of the more classical health um, markers, which are jitter and shimmer, which are basically measuring very small um, permutations in pitch or in intensity, we can see that these are massively affected by the presence of reverberation, particularly. And this result is very interesting as these are two very commonly used health markers and we can see that their sensitivity to microphone type and device type is there and what's concerning for us is that the direction of these changes relates to definitely a de change in something like depression status so for example if you're trying to uh, translate things as they currently stand into the real world all someone would have to do is potentially change rooms from recording in their living room to recording maybe in a kitchen or a bathroom and that would change their depression status. So these aren't particularly robust technologies at the moment and things we definitely have to build forward to. Looking at properties of the vocal tracks, so these are measured through form and frequencies, we can see again that the, in particular the recording device matters in this sort of scenario. So there's a lot of different things that these problems we need to be aware of, take into account and look potentially even for more robust features full stop when we're starting to design sort of M health or well, speech-based M health scenarios. One thing we need to understand is variability. So we need to sort of validate what natural variability is in speech signals compared to variability of different pathologies and interests. And again, the recent UK, you can grant that Judith and myself were awarded is going to look into some of these factors. I've just got results from one of the few studies in the literature that actually looked at sort of repeat analysis. So they just recorded speech in one day, asked participants to come back the next day and recorded their speech again, and looked at the sort of um, test retest measure between different scenarios and found 
that the intercorrelation coefficient between the feature extracted one day, feature extracted the next day is huge and definitely below a threshold that would meet a sort of acceptable value for a medical device. So again, we know that there's a lot of these factors affecting the collection of speech, affecting the variability of the signal and things that might not necessarily be able to sort of pull apart through artificial intelligence. Um, quite recently, the, the UK Health Authority, together with the Turing Institute, ran a study trying to look for digital phenotypes of COVID. Uh, they collected a massive amount of data and they were essentially found that audio classifiers were outperformed by predictions based simply on user reported symptoms. They tried to unpack this a little bit and found that enrollment biases were identified as a key confounding factor. I've gone through their study looking at this and thinking about some of these factors we've just been speaking about relating to collection, relating to measurement errors. Uh, the study does not did not collect anything related to device type. They provided no evidence for their choice of speech prompt and their AI systems or two out of the three AI systems were based on male frequency capsule coefficients, which is a spectral feature. And you can find in the literature, the reliability that these is questioned in clinical settings because of all these factors that we've been speaking about, about noise and even about differences in path pathologies, just making that sure these, these um, features aren't very stable in their collection as well. So yeah, there's, it was a very interesting study. Their sort of recommendations towards enrollment biases were, were quite interesting, but at the same time, there were a lot of things that weren't covered in this study and a lot of confounders that weren't really spoken about. So yeah, there's a lot we have to do, especially as I said, coming from this acoustics angle. Um, We've also got challenges, of course, relating to how we use artificial intelligence in this area. And you've probably noticed that I've spoken a lot of different health conditions and used a lot of the same features to speak about them. And yeah, we definitely have this big overlap between having speech features that are non-specific to different health conditions. So a lot of the time when we want to pull apart different health conditions, we need to move into the use of artificial intelligence, namely machine learning to help us find these different patterns. And of course, the shortcomings of using AI in medical applications are well known. Differences, we've got challenges generalizing to new populations. And this is a result of us often doing retrospective studies. So having data that was previously collected and continually sort of analyzing that and almost all speech research is sort of focused on historic data. We have a lack of reporting standards in the area and this makes us harder to conduct peer reviews and look for strong, gather strong evidence bases. And of course, it's often hard to compare between different algorithms and realize the strength of all of these. And another big aspect that is particularly medical is related to metrics that don't often reflect clinical applicability. And this is particularly important because we know machine learning is brittle and opaque. We know that machine learning will take shortcuts. And we also know there's rules like Goddard's law, Occam's razor, no free lunch theorem, that all sort of point towards us not being able to understand or assume the different forms of these shortcuts that machine learning can make. And if we're then trying to summarize things on just one learning outcome, such as accuracy, we've really got an incomplete description of the real world task that we're trying to do. If we're just saying to someone, you do or don't have depression, we are obviously only answering one part of a problem and we need to be conducting studies in the future and soon to think how can we design studies and metrics that actually start to demonstrate user benefits. And Within this, we've obviously got to also sort of think about how we're reporting standards because the no free lunch theorem tells us that there's no one universally good machine learning model. It's all based on the assumptions we make about the form of our training data, the assumptions we make on the AI algorithm, and we really need to do rigorous analysis to determine what is the best model given data at hand, and we need to report these in a more sort of open manner. We need to be reporting more about data collection factors, allowing more reproducibility in studies, reporting more demographics and co-founding comorbidities in the health status, reporting model performances across different metrics 
and using confidence intervals within this and trying to look at the range of how we prescribe things. And of course, dissemination, making code available, using open science as best we can. And sort of all of this does come together at the end as well, when we want to make products, especially in health, that relate to beneficial change for patients. And the only way we're going to do it, realize this, is through patient and public involvement in our research. So carrying out research with members of the public rather than for members of the public. And this can have benefits in data collection, in trying to, well, improve our apps for one thing, also getting access to different populations and getting wider access into our studies. We might be not measuring the right targets if we don't speak to people with lived experience in these different conditions. And we can also help in sort of what are our best, what are our most meaningful results coming from these different studies. So that's where I'm going to sort of end things there and sort of conclude here by saying that speech is a powerful marker of health. We ran a long longitudinal study where we did note the choice of speech task is very important for patient experience and data collection. We ran a lot of language agnostic depression markers, speech rate articulation rate intensity, and that we've realized there's a wide range of transitional challenges that come through with this. There's this full collection of data collection pipeline that contains many different sources of errors, and this can't be fixed through AI alone, the community really needs to come together to solve these challenges and look at working together to sort of help increase verification and help increase validation in this whole area. So yeah, thanks for listening to me. Thanks again to Dr. Judith Dinley and to Edward Campbell for their great work and great research together that we've been doing over the past couple of years and some really exciting work that we're going to do with UCAN and I hope to be reporting back to you again in the near future with some results of yeah more looking I guess at these acoustic measurement factors and how these sort of affect speech collection so thanks for your time today and I'll take some I'll stop sharing my slides and I'll take some questions. So there's a few questions coming in in the chat um, that um, Keith was asking what about singing. Um, I don't believe there's any studies that have looked at how health affects singing to the best of my knowledge. Obviously singing does sort of change the style of I guess acoustics that we're recording and there probably would be some measurable effects coming through but nothing that I'm aware of in the literature. Amelia is asking our baseline measures for the same speaker required can we say anything about the likelihood of pathologies if we only have a pathological sample? I mean it's a very good point you're making there and we did have quite a range of baseline measures there that we have. So yes, it would be better looking at healthy controls as well and looking at collection and collection rates over healthy controls. We're about to run other large studies in different clinical domains here at KCL looking at ADHD in particular. And this might start to give us insights into different effects as well. But yes, a study that does have healthy controls would give us some more insights through here. Um, Jan was asking, in the participant engagement questionnaire, which barriers prevented participation for recording speech? Could they record for more than, could they record more than one reason? Yes, we allowed multiple reasons across the participation engagement people were allowed to choose more than one entry we also had an other box for things that we didn't cover so it's not not just one person reporting one factor they were allowed to record multiple factors and the results presented were from multiple factors uh finian which speech features were most successful in the prediction and classification of de depression severity level 
I guess it was a combination opinion that we were using there of different feature grouping and different machine learning networks. So a little bit hard to pull apart. We did find that the um, sort of Mel Spectrum and the, the sequence, the sequence learner did the best overall, but I wouldn't necessarily say there was a clear winner and we definitely need to pull apart more of that sort of combination of features and learning methodologies to sort of learn later. I think that also we need to think about how, uh, what features we feed in and sort of resolution of different features to the, how they might perform in a classifier as well. Uh, Stefan Black ethics. How did you justify the collection of storage of collection and storage of personal data to your ethics committee? Um, the ethics was, um, ethics was obviously approved by the three local ethics committees at all collection sites. Personal data in terms of identifiable socio-demographics data was collected and stored in a secure environment that only a small number of our clinical researchers had access to. So if I needed demographical information myself as part of an analyticals work package, I had to go and ask the clinical guys to extract this from that platform for me. In terms of the speech collection, we were able to collect, we were granted ethical permission to collect speech. The caveats from the ethics were that people didn't have to record the speech sample. They were given the option to skip if they wanted to skip. And we also had ethics constraints on not being able to listen fully to the recordings whilst it was an active study. And this was more done from a patient health standpoint. So people couldn't leave messages to us as researchers the, about their sort of health status and particularly towards suicidal tendencies and things like that. It was made very clear the, they, yeah, no one, no one, while it was an active study, were listening to this. So, yeah, I hope that sort of answers your questions if you want something more specific. Um, Stefan, again, could this technique be used for hearing loss? I'm presenting a few techniques if you want to come back to that in the chat and say which techniques. Um, well, which I'm happy to answer that one again. Uh, Alistair, how long did each collection session last? So on average, each collection session is about 15 to 20 seconds. And all up, it took people a couple of minutes by the time they'd read the instructions on the app, done the recording. We gave them the chance to re-record if they did want to. So yeah, it was all up a very, very short collection paradigm. So Zara, is there a way to get access to the speech data you have collected for academic purposes? Um, please contact me separately about that. Um, in general, there is ways, but we do need to seek ethics approval, depending exactly what needs to be done. And generally the data can't be shared outside of KCL or one of the other partners in the study, but there are ways and means that we could come together to work on different things. So please contact me about that. Tom Hampton, any insights into children? There's been health and like depression. There have been one study I know of where people tried to look at health samples of children and go on to predict future likelihood of depression. That was conducted in like the late nineties, I think quite a while ago. Most of the other sort of child studies do um, focus things on learning difficulties, atypical speech, atypical development. There, the sort of, I guess, teenage area is something that is potentially understudied there. So thanks for that. Um, moving back to Jan again, very interesting talk. I understand why you focus on depression, but I'm interested in deciding how happy a person is an example. Uh, is there an opportunity to use this approach? Um, definitely, I think there'd be ways and means in and around that and very happy 
the either Judith or myself or both of us would be very happy to talk to you about that. Uh, Stephen, fascinating presentation. Thank you, Stephen, again. People with hearing loss also communicate differently, longer pauses, asking for clarification. Could this be picked up on speech AI? Again, that would be a really interesting study to do. And yes, if there's a clear sort of, I guess, acoustic structuring relating to deafness as well as the prosodic information, there would be a chance there that we we're able to design systems that could recognize that. Um, a few other sort of thank yous at the end. And yeah, definitely do reach out to myself, reach out to Judith. We're both up now on the UCAN website. There's one of the new grants there. Um, part of our reason for going for the grant was to communicate more with you guys and get part and involved in the community. And yeah, I'm going to end the chat there and the discussion there. And thanks to everybody for their time. And I look forward to working more closely, hopefully with some of you in the future. Bye.